Now on Radio 4, listen to The Cinema with David Huckfell for the second of his programmes. It's horror movies that are the subject. With that terrifying sound, composer James Bernard created the unofficial fanfare of Hammer Films, the studio responsible for two decades of horror, mystery and fantasy. So what inspires him to create such terrifying themes? I have found it often works very well to use the title of the film, and the best known one, obviously, is Dracula, which of course in the States is known as the horror of Dracula, but when it first came out in England it was known as Dracula. So. The words Dracula uh, obviously gave me the rhythm and the theme, Dracula. And then I found that that seemed to often work. And people think it's peculiar, but then I was thinking about it the other day, and I was thinking, well, you take a, a song by Schubert, to take a very sort of high example, obviously he gets a, the idea for a tune from the opening lines of, a, of, mm -hmm. of the poem he's setting. I, I would have imagined that's what happened. And so I found it worked extremely well often, like Taste the Blood of Dracula, Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed. They give a sort of rhythm and they give you something to start, a little handle to start from. For me, it's a lot of hard work. You've got four weeks was an average. Uh, five weeks would be luxury. During those four to five weeks, you'd got to invent the music, time it exactly. So there's a lot of maths involved because it's going to save a lot of time when you've got limited time at, at the music recording sessions, the orchestra's being paid a large amount of money, you've only got so many hours, three hours per session, and you may have two, three, four sessions, according to how much music, with an hour's overtime if you want it. So you must make sure that if the conductor conducts the orchestra at exactly the pace you mark on the score, all the points of synchronization will clock into place, and there'll be no problem. In so many horror films, it's the music that's the most terrifying element. Indeed, in horror, you could say that music is one of the most important means of suspending disbelief, as David Whittaker, composer for two Hammer films, explains. A film like a Hammer film or a sorcery film is rather like a car without wheels. It's got to have wheels on it so that it starts moving, and the music is vital, like it used to be, I suppose, in the old day movies, when there was music from start to finish when people didn't use click tracks and the conductors were marvellous and they could stretch everything to fit. When the young heroine, Lucy, is preparing herself to receive the Count in Hammer's first Dracula film, it's James Bernard's classic score that sets the pulse racing. I wanted a sort of sweet kind of sound, but sweet in an unhealthy way. So I used intervals of a third, which is a fairly sort of nice kind of interval. It's not discordant, basically. And then... As she becomes more uh, hypnotized by Dracula, uh, I bring in a sort of ostinato, which means a repeated figure, on a vibraphone and a piano, which just gives a feeling of somebody being hypnotized. That, that's what I hoped. Then you build that up and increase the, the volume and the intensity until the bite. Christopher Gunning found himself in a similar musical situation with Peter Shazdy's 1971 film for Hammer, Hands of the Ripper, in which Angelad Rees plays Jack the Ripper's daughter. I tried to convey the idea musically that she was somebody possessed. So there are quite long stretches where you just have three or four notes, clusters, played by the violins and vibraphones, just sort of gently making away. Just thinking, and this girl is... So, are there any particular instruments that seem better to convey a sense of darkness and menace? Carl Davis... 
Horror Films explain. The most obvious thing is to actually choose low instruments, low register instruments, evoke dark, you know, so that, you know, lower strings, uh, shallows, double basses, low brass. And then there are low woodwind instruments as well. Sound, a dark sound, a bass drum, very low, and so on, tam tam, very low, all mixtures of these sort of sounds. But sometimes you might want to do the opposite. If you say the picture is dark, maybe you don't have to be dark because the audience is already getting that information from the screen that the, the picture is dark, the image is dark. But maybe we want to say, well, the leading character is very frightened and slowly becomes aware of his problem <laughs> or his adversary in the dark. And so you might actually choose to do something rather high and strange, you know, a kind of music that, that John Williams wrote for Elements in Close Encounters, which was very, in the main, really very high and odd. You know, so it needn't always be that. It simply depends on the context. <laughs> David Raxin found an effective orchestral combination to set the teeth on edge, which he used in the 1955 thriller The Big Combo, in which the police crush a crime syndicate. It had some particularly brutal scenes of torture in it for the time, and I asked him how he used the music to heighten the effect. They torture Cornell Wilde by putting earphones on him and playing the music very loudly, so I wrote a piece which had a big drum solo in it, which was played by Shelley Mann. And it's a pretty exciting thing, you know, if you've got to torture somebody, it's got to either be trombones or drums. A different kind of torture was inflicted upon the brain of one Professor Brandt in Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed, which the wicked baron transplants into another body. Frankenstein himself was played, of course, by Peter Cushing, and James Bernard needed to reflect the tension of the operation in musical terms, first of all with a vibraphone. Concentrate. Hold his head. Rigid. Lower. I had a sort of underneath that lower strings going sort of whoop, whoop, as though Peter was doing this operation on the head and very neat and very careful. So, you know, can I do it? Whoop, that's it. Next bit. And then you heard the sounds of sawing through the skull. I think that was the sort of idea. Whilst working on Hammer's Countess Dracula, composer Harry Robinson was introduced to the particularly unnerving sound of the bowed vibraphone by percussionist Tristan Fry. The only way you can do it, in fact, is by speaking to musicians and saying, you know, what kind of weird kind of thing can you do on your, on your instrument? And he was the one that actually pushed this idea of that he could bow the vibes and it would make this really eerie sound. And here it is accompanying the wicked Countess Battery's discovery that the blood of a prostitute doesn't have quite the same rejuvenative qualities as that of a virgin. Don't be... Don't be look at me! I did the same as before and it didn't work. I don't know, maybe it doesn't wait, work wait. anymore. The book! What book? Countess Dracula was not only based on the true story of a real Hungarian countess, but it was also directed and produced by Hungarians as well, who wanted authentic Hungarian music, particularly for a scene featuring gypsy dancers. Now, the only thing I had at that time, funnily enough, was somebody had said to me, you must hear this new sound, and it was Georgie Zamfir. 
playing the pan pipes. And it was the very first LP he'd ever made. And on it, there were some fiery kind of Romanian music. So one of them reminded me of something, and it was actually a Scottish reel. So I wrote, I wrote the Scottish reel and did it for the Countess Dracula. And the Hungarian producer said, now that is what I call authentic. And I didn't like telling him it was, um, you know, something from the, <laughs> the Grampians. <laughs> Jeffrey Bergen's music for the television adaptation of Dickens' Martin Chuzzlewit contains several examples of sinister scoring, particularly in the music for the wicked Jonas and the death scene of the man whose murder he plots, his own father, Anthony Chuzzlewit. I used a lot of bass clarinet and bassoon and a lot of low register, cor anglais um, instruments, a lot of instruments, either low instruments like the bass clarinet and cor anglais, but also instruments playing very low down, the horns playing very low down, lots of viola and cello and bass, which does give obviously that, that rather dark, uh, sinister, very threatening sort of sound. The composer I thought of was, was actually Verdi, but I also, I quoted the Dies Irae from the, um, the Requiem Mass, although not many people spotted that, but it's in the texture and with obviously his association with that. But the, although the music doesn't sound anything like it, I did think very much of Verdi and opera in general. I, I, I thought it, the show was so dramatic in that way that it, um, and in fact, it was the way the director directed the actors. He said, I want you to go over the top as much as you, you feel. And they did, and, and the music obviously needed to match that. Another effect which Verdi lends to horror film music is to repeat a small theme and on each repetition raise everything by a semitone, like this example from Rigoletto. In Taste the Blood of Dracula, James Bernard took a similar approach. I'm afraid that has to happen a great deal in, in horror films, I think, because it sounds awfully sort of obvious, but if you have a, a repeated motif and you slowly bring it up higher and higher and higher and build up on the orchestration, it does indubitably create a, a, a sense of growing tension. And, I mean, it's really very simple. But, I mean, if you, if you took a, a theme and you kept playing it lower and lower. That might work, but it's, I don't think it would be so, so effective. You somehow need the increase of, of pitch all the time. So as nerves reach sort of screaming pitch, you know, the, the music also has to reach screaming pitch. But even a master of terror like James Bernard wasn't quite sure how to create exactly the effect he wanted in Hammer's film, The Gorgon. Well, you know the Gorgon with all her terrible snakes and Medusa with her snakes on her head. Well, I, I wanted to see if I could get a sort of hissing effect in the music. And Jimmy Blades, he came to me and he said, can I take this page of the score and put it in my book on percussion that I'm working on? I said, yes, gladly. He said, I've had all sorts of requests in my life, but this is one of the strangest ones I've ever had, because I'd simply written in the score, amongst all the other things he was doing, drums and whatever, I wanted to have a hissing effect, and I didn't know how to get it, so I'd written a sort of long-held note with a thing like a trill above it, and I'd simply written hiss, and he said, that, that's a real challenge. You only look once on the face of the Gorgon, but the film which made you look twice before going into the shower owed an equal debt to the terrifying power of music. I 
I think the uh, Bernard Herrmann Scopus Psycho is a kind of classic of, of suspense, and, and at the same time, using very sophisticated scoring of only string instruments, limiting his palette of color. And those, that, that was really about it being driven and hysterical and, and you know, rather high, screamy sounds, not so much dark. The importance of music in films of suspense and terror is all too often overlooked, sometimes resented by directors who would rather take all the credit for the picture themselves, as David Raxin explains. I never admired Mr. Hitchcock. I knew too much about him, and I'd seen him at parties and things like that. I thought he was a miserable, sullen, wicked man who was a talented filmmaker, but he had a lot of fraudulent stuff in his films where he depended upon ridiculous coincidences and things like that. And also, he was a cruel man. You know, what he owed to Bernard Herrmann, he could not have repaid in a whole lifetime. Benny worked for him for 17 years and did 10 film scores for him and tried to imagine Psycho or Vertigo or North by Northwest without Herman's music. They would never have worked as well, never. And in the end, he was abominably cruel. Uh, they brought Herman over from England to work on Torn Curtain. And by that time, Hitchcock had run into trouble and people who had been hurt by him were sort of revenging themselves upon him, you know, retribution time. And uh, the studio people who would never have dared to talk to him this way were saying, now listen, Hitch, you don't want one of those old-fashioned scores. What you need is something that is now, that's with it, which couldn't have meant Herman. Well, when Herman came over, he got to talking to some of these same studio people, and they were telling him that they needed a, quote, now score. And Benny said, well, that doesn't mean me. He said, why don't you pay me off and I'll go back. And the more he demurred, the more they felt they had to keep him. So they did, and he wrote this amazing score. I remember because the day before he recorded it, he showed me the score of the picture, including the main title, which was astonishing for an amazing combination of lots and lots of woodwinds and lots and lots of brass, you know, seven of this, eight of that, six of that, nine of the other, and all that. And it was absolutely extraordinary. And in his style, it began with a tearing sound. Anyhow, I wasn't present at the recording. I was working on something, so I couldn't go. But one of my friends was there and played lead cello, Edgar Lustgarten. And he called me up to say that Hitchcock had come in and denounced Benny and said the music was not what I want. And Benny, who was not a conciliatory person, had said, listen, Hitch, you're paying for this recording anyhow. Why don't you let me finish? And then you can decide what you want to do with it. And Hitchcock said no. He wished to humiliate Benny. Some directors are more sensitive, like Joseph Losey. James Bernardigan. He couldn't really explain what he wanted. I can't remember what the bit was, but as you remember, it's a science fiction film. And it was a sort of science fiction effect we were trying to get. And he said, no, there's something missing there. So I said, OK. Joe, let me have a talk with John, who was the conductor and the music director. So I got into a huddle with John. And I said, what do we do? And he said, I've got an idea. Go to the piano and stand by the strings so that you can plink the strings with your finger. And he said, when I give you the signal, plink the strings, and we'll do the section again, but just with plinking the strings when I tell you. And we did that. I couldn't see it made any difference at all. But at the end, dear Joe said, perfect. Just what I wanted. <laughs> Sometimes composing a score for horror can be even more horrifying than watching the film. Alan Gibson's Goodbye Gemini required music for a ritual murder sequence. Christopher Gunning had to write the music. I experienced a severe composing block during it, which is jolly frightening when you've got a deadline to meet. What was needed for that sequence was something that started very, very simply and indeed continued with a simple element going on but of course became more and more manic as it went on and it was quite long it was several minutes long and i know i got to kind of four minutes and thought help <laughs> i can't carry on with this <laughs> it was one of the few occasions where i phoned up a colleague and said look i'm totally stuck help and i remember him coming round and suggesting one or two things, and then I composed away quite happily and finished it the same day. <laughs>
and I'm happy to say I've performed the same function for him since. <laughs> Goodbye Gemini was released in 1970, by which time the House of Horror itself, Hammer Films, had begun to diversify their treatment of horror characters. Vampire Circus was one of their later attempts. David Whittaker wrote a gigantic score to help the picture along. You had to have horror impact from the very, very, uh, very beginning. It starts in the picture with this village girl having been kidnapped by this particular vampire. It was the campest vampire you've ever seen in your life. It's quite incredible. And um, he seduces her. And of course, with that, I had this full orchestral music. And the music in breaks into another waltz. But this one is a sort of a 6-4 type waltz, really, a, a lugubrious sound and using this, the uh, symbol and things like that in it. But not all Hammer films used typical horror scores. Monty Norman tried a different approach when he collaborated with David Henniker on Hammer's The Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll. Well, we tried very hard not to make it a typical Hammer horror film score because we felt that we'd like to try something, in a sense, sort of going in the opposite direction. So what we did was we played against most of the thrills and horror. I mean, obviously, there are times when you have to point out certain things musically. But basically, we did, as you say, we did play very much against it. Some of it was very romantic. Uh, we did quite a bit of research on Victorian music of the time. And there was a sort of big ball sequence, which seemed to work very well using a kind of pure melody, rather than anything sort of sinister. And an interesting thing that happened was I had to write for when Mr. Hyde becomes very decadent. He goes into some brothel or other. And uh, we decided we wanted a, a lady with a snake to do a dance. So I had to interview ladies with snakes. And a friend of mine uh, at the time was uh, Paul Raymond. And he said, well, why don't you go along to the Raymond Review Bar and see this lady who is... Um, working with her snake. <laughs> so I went along and uh, met her in her dressing room afterwards. And it was quite embarrassing because she showed me all the things <laughs> that could be done with a snake. <laughs> but anyway, she got the job. Tigers needn't lick their lips over her unless they're very rich. Is she so exclusive? Only princes, pashas, millionaires or distinguished actor managers need apply. In The Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll, screenwriter Wolf Mankiewicz gave the old story a novel twist by making Dr. Jekyll, played by Paul Massey, an old and rather unappealing character with a grey beard and his alter ego, Mr. Hyde, a suave and sexually attractive young man. Hammer's next version of the story was even more unusual. Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde made Dr. Jekyll, played by Ralph Bates, transform into the beautiful Martina Bezik. David Whittaker wrote the score, which, like Monty Norman's, opens with a romantic waltz. I chose it thinking of, of that era, because it was Victorian era, and I thought it won't be a giveaway if one starts off a film with music which sounds like horror music. Um, it's telegraphing the thing far too much. People know they're going to watch a horror anyway, but musically, I thought that it would be nice and gentle. 
climax of the film concerning the struggle of Dr. Jekyll to defeat Sister Hyde is accompanied by music that follows the time-honored tradition of Richard Adinsell's Warsaw Concerto. The piano, which came in basically right at the end uh, of the movie, it was something which just happened. I thought to myself, can I get away with it? Ever since I was, you know, very young, uh, the, the piano concerto has always been the dramatic moment. So, having supped full of horrors, let's end with David Whittaker's extravagant finale as Ralph Bates's Dr. Jekyll breathes his last, in this film anyway, to the orchestral equivalent of Hammer Studios at their most full-blooded. to the Hammer film Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. David Huckfell will be back next week at the same time when his subject will be comedy. The producer was Anthony Sellers.